Today we are interviewing Dr. Maya Flex, who has such a rich education that I would like her to introduce herself. My name is Maya. Um, in terms of my educational history, I grew up in Singapore. I went, I attended a non-Jewish school, a British school in Singapore. And thereafter I came to university in London, studied law in UCL, and worked as a criminal defence barrister for a London set of chambers. And um, most recently I have completed a PhD and have become a university lecturer in criminology. Tell me what your PhD is about. My PhD is on anti-Semitism. The university was seeking to employ someone to conduct research on anti-Semitism in general, what the Jewish community in general feels about anti-Semitism. Um, however, if you do end up reading any literature on anti-Semitism, you would see that there's lots written about um, the perceptions of Chiloni, of the secular Jews, and how they would managed to deal with anti-Semitism. Uh, and yet there's very, very little writ written about the Haredi community. And that's rather paradoxical, as it is the Orthodox Jews who are most visible, who are most identifiable as Orthodox Jews, and are the ones who are most targeted within the community. Right. So it was important for me to fill that gap and to make a contribution to knowledge in exploring what are the perceptions of the Orthodox Jews about anti-Semitism, how are they managing, how do they feel living as British Orthodox Jews in the UK? Wow. So how did you go about like researching for this PhD? Um, I was very thankful that I'm considered an insider. If right. you're part of a group, you're considered an insider. So obviously being an insider meant that a lot of people were prepared to talk about it yes. and actually were quite keen to express their concerns or lack of fears or whatever it may be. Or their experiences. Their experiences too. Yes. Um, I was exposed to incidents that I was never aware of, anti-Semitic incidents, through conducting interviews both in Northwest London as well as Stamford Hill. Wow. I conducted focus groups, so I met with a prominent Rabonim, I met with um, Shomrim Northwest, Shomrim um, Stamford Hill, I met with Jewish police officers who are based in Charing Cross Station, wow. and I met with the Barnet Jewish counsellors. So what I wanted to get is not just the individual's experiences of anti-Semitism, but the entire structures around it, and what the entire community on a professional level as well as an individual level, and how they perceive this phenomenon. Wow. And what did you discover? I discovered a number of things. Firstly, I discovered that actually uh, victimization of anti-Semitism is more prevalent than I thought. Wow. Some of it can be very trivial, the shouting out of the car, shouting a bit of abuse, the occasional throwing of the eggs. Um, so, firstly, I was made aware that it's become far more prevalent. Right. Second, I was made aware that people actually don't feel that there is a resurgence of anti-Semitism. People feel, on the whole, that anti-Semitism is a constant, that it's always been it will always be, just like the sun shines and the moon wanes. There will always be anti-Semitism. What they do feel is that there's been a shift in its manifestation. So whereas 30 years ago, if you were to ask people who are older than us, how did you experience anti-Semitism, they would say it would be the shouting out of the car, or the hitting of the hat of your head, or the throwing of the egg. It's now shifted mm -hmm. to far more overt and blatant places. So it's become much more institutionalized. Right. Politically, mm -hmm. uh, anti-Semitism, yes. the discourse of anti-Semitism has become a regular read of ours uh, within the media, yes. which obviously has endless perpetuations geographically in terms of cultures and communities. Yes. On campus, yes. there's an increase yes. in anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. more of a concern. And like I said, the type of violence that people are now exposed to has shifted. So it's small, verbal, and it's more from higher echelons of society that we wow. didn't really expect, wow. we least expect. So that was another finding. But the most beautiful finding, and I feel like my real contribution to, of the PhD, was the coping mechanisms that the Jewish people endured in managing their victimization rates. Because previous re research 
on secular Jews had shown that they were actually v really impacted in terms of the victimization. And I thought we would see even more of that within our community. What do you mean, internal impact? Internal, they were really distraught like, yes. that somebody would shout at them a Jew or would be discriminated at work because of the Jewish status. So I thought because Jews and the victimization of Orthodox Jews is more prevalent, I will see that even more... Um, the trauma would be greater. Yes, within our community. Yeah. However, it proved to be the complete opposite. Really? It showed actually that Orthodox Jews um, normalized their incidents and accepted mm -hmm. what happened. And up upon more reflection as to why that was, why is it that Orthodox Jews, despite the regular prevalence of offending, managed to fend off the victimization? In do you think they fended it off or do you think they just internalized it or do you feel that they just accepted that this is the new norm? Yes, they did accept that it's a new norm, but how? You need a lot of resilience and you need a lot of kochos to say, I can manage with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. And a, a deeper, closer look at the, as to why revealed that there was two reasons as to why Orthodox Jews managed to do it. The one is the very strong religious identity. Yeah. You know, religion is an integral part of who we are. And yeah. being Jews is an integral part of each and every one of us. Yes. Yeah. Um, and our relationship with Hashem and being a couple that certain adversities would come our way is part of our way yes. of life. Yes. We, we have to internalize that very early on. Yeah. So that resilience is something that is embedded within us. The second factor is our strong community and close cohesion ties. So if you look at other victims of hate crime, they don't have those tight-knit, close community that we belong to. And therefore, they had nothing to fall back on. And we have a whole system, system in mm -hmm. place to support us in the, the event that something happens. So um, this completely unusual coping mechanisms, despite the regular adversity, is something very unusual. And something that actually, at the end, my PhD was a real Kiddush Hashem. Because when I do have an occasional opportunity to present it, yes. it really is against all the dominant narratives of other hate crime victims. It goes against all other literatures, victims of Islamophobia, victims of disability hate crime, other race hate crimes. They've chosen to withdraw from communities. They've chosen to isolate themselves from certain circles. Some have had to uh, negotiate their identity, re re remove their hijab, remove their veil you know, become more westernized, and yet we keep very true to our identity, right. true to our roots, true to yes. what we believe in, and in fact, if anything, these kind of adversities bring us closer to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. We don't really know why labor was defeated so extreme, in such an extreme way. We were very concerned that labor would be elected pre yes. last yes. Thursday. Yeah. How did you manage to juggle writing a PhD, which is massive, and running a family life. Somebody gave me the analogy that a PhD is like a marathon. And if you're a runner, you would know that a marathon is a slow, long jog. Yes. It's not a sprint, yeah. and it's not short. Yeah. And as long as you keep on running, you'll get to the end. And yes. really, that's what it felt like. It was, you had to put in the work, and I couldn't stop, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't have done this PhD without, you know, first the support of my parents, you know, who have cheered me along from across the ocean for, for always. But with my very close-knit friends and my yes. husband, I couldn't have done this without my husband. No. Who, I had to make a choice when I did this PhD, which is, is my husband going to run the errands for me or is he going to be my proofreader? Right. <laughs> I couldn't have both. I couldn't have him correcting and perfecting. Yes. And picking up the kids and the dry cleaning. Right. I had to make a very conscious choice and I chose him to be the second mummy in the house. Yes. Which he did very well. Wow. Yeah. You, oh, you, you sure. need that. You need a partner who's totally yes. supportive and yes. on board when you take on such a big project. Yeah. Is it now ready to be turned into a book for the Jewish community it's to read? It's going to be published into wow. a PhD in the British Library, but I'm on hold in terms of publishing it, putting it into a book, because that again will be 
even though it is in the format of a book, but it would need tweaking. Yes. Um, I'm publishing articles. It's going out into journal articles. Okay. So I'm getting Amazing. I'm getting it out there, which okay. is I wanted it to be disseminated. I'm also hoping that Shomrim will use it in terms of gaining funding, get, being heard by the chief constables in terms of giving them the same powers that the CSD has to channel the powers to Shomrim, who yes. I believe the Orthodox Jewish community feels more at ease with and yes. will, will, will trust that organization. So they're using it at the moment to try and um, seek resources that were not available to them beforehand. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Can't Thank you wait. for the opportunity.